So did you come to praise the Lord this morning? Did you come to glorify and magnify His name? If you came to worship Him, I would love for you to get out of your seat and just either come up to the front, stand in the aisle, walk across the back, because we're going to worship Him today. As Brother Larry said, we're going to break out of our normalcy. We're going to break out of our area of familiarity. And the only way you could do it is to initially take that first step and say, okay, God, I know this is what I normally do, but I'm going to do what you desire me to do. And so I don't know what that is at the moment, but I'm going to step out and I'm going to say, here I am, Father, use me. Use me for your glory. Use me for your praise. God, just rest on us with your spirit. Father, just pour your spirit out on this house. And whatever you desire, let us be willing to step in and cooperate with your spirit. I don't want to go through a normal Sunday. I don't want to leave the same way I came. I want to encounter your presence, oh God, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And as the spirit was moving over the water, spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us.
your presence, Ooh. Lord. Jesus. 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 We worship you, God. We adore you.
Treasure of my heart, treasure of my heart and of my soul. In my weakness, in my weakness, you are merciful. You are strong. The redeemer of my past and present wrong. See, the good thing about God is He doesn't hold you for your past. Older of my future, but He holds you for your to future. Come.
is heaven to me. places and services like this and when we get into these moments where we feel the presence of God a lot of times you you think in your mind what should I say and, and how should I respond to this and the, the appropriate thing is just tell him thank you thank you for being here thank you for loving me thank you for keeping your hand on us God does so many things for us we don't even think about all he actually does he's constantly moving in our behalf. Worship is about wonder. It's a wonder God puts up with us. It's a wonder how he loves us so much. It's a wonder how he provides what he does the way he does. It's amazing the plan he has for us. 
And it's even more amazing how we struggle to align ourselves with that plan. But he loves us nonetheless. His mercy endures forever. We wake up every day to this fresh new reality that he loves us even again today. And so today as we come into this place, anytime you come into his presence, anytime you feel him, stop wherever you are and give him the time of just saying thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here. There are many churches today where the Holy Spirit is not there. They're not there. They just sing a few songs and say a few things and go home, and they never feel anything different. The Holy Spirit is in this place. The Spirit of God is in this place. And it's a powerful reality to know He loves us so much that He's in this place. And that's why you know anything can happen. We limit God by our unbelief. It's our unbelief that stops more of God's movement. Jesus will do anything. He proved that time and time again. And when his presence is in the room, we just receive in faith. Speak to the thing. Tell it out to get out of our life and receive the healing that Jesus paid for. Receive the provision he already paid for. He became poor that we may be wealthy. In the, in the life that we live, we can have abundance. It's not always about how much is in your bank account. Listen, there are people that are wealthy people taking their life every day because they don't have the peace. Money didn't bring you peace. The Prince of Peace brings you peace. Today, it's an honor to serve him. It's an honor to love him. It's an honor. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to think of something in your mind, the greatest need that you have. Because a lot of times what we do is we come to church just hoping God will change our situation. And I think every time we get to church, the Lord hopes we understand our situation. It's taken him all these years and all this time to get you in the place you are. Now it's time to finish processing and grow up. Amen. Amen. Stop thinking about your condition and start becoming aware of your position. Amen. God is real. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our life. Thank you for moving in this place. Thank you for moving in our life. Thank you, Lord, that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, most of all. Because, Lord, at any moment, at any time, at any second, it could be our last breath. Thank you, Lord, that we're in the palm of your hands and Satan can't do a thing about it. We thank you, Lord, for dying for us, for shedding your blood for us. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done and what you're about to do. And, Lord, we dedicate our hearts in this place afresh to worship you, to love you, to just embrace you no matter what's going on. Lord, we adore you in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand praise. He deserves it, amen. (laughs) I just want to start with a couple of verses that I think are primary for you and I to understand what the Lord is going to say this morning, what he's put in my heart to share with you. And it's so important, it's so real that I really think you need to, to prioritize what's happening this morning. Take some notes, write, write, write down, put notes in your phone, uh, write on your spouse's arm with an ink pen. I don't care. Just make references to what's going to happen today so you can go back and look this stuff up and begin to really dig out what the Lord wants you to receive from this. The beautiful thing about the Lord is he can take, he can take what he's prepared and it will feed everybody. It's not, it's not just a meal prepared for one person, but the Lord can take that. The Spirit of God can take that and touch your heart somewhere in the mix of all of it. Amen? In the book of Ephesians, if you found that, I'd like to ask you to stand. Uh, there, there's just a, a respect and an honor that should go with the Word of God. I know this is something that we don't historically or customarily do, but today I really feel like we need to do this because I think the Lord wants to emphasize us getting into his word. 
Not, not some YouTube download, not some uh, podcast, but get into his word because life and faith are built from getting into his word. Amen? In the book of Ephesians in chapter 1, I want you to look at verse 17. This is a prayer Paul's praying to the, for this church in, in Ephesus. And here's what he says in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is in the saints amen let's pray heavenly father we are so delighted to be here in this place today and we're more delighted that you're here in this place today Take this word and enrich our hearts. Give us that spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you so that we can understand and embrace and take in your word and let it germinate and grow and bring forth that hundredfold harvest in our lives that we need so desperately. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. you may be seated. <clears throat> Today is going to be part two of the spiritual virtues of faith, and, and the part that I didn't get to last week, I'm going to start with this week and see how far we go, but we're just going to let the Lord direct traffic. That's the best way to do it and not rush anything. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about Jesus the Creator, Jesus the Creator. The more I studied this, the more I sat in my chair and wept. We all know about Jesus the Creator. We know this, we know that, we think we know this, we think we know that. But, but when we get a full picture or a revelation of who he actually is, what he has done and what he is doing now, it can change the way that you see everything. It can change your perspective on your entire life. See, I know for a fact that many of you have already settled. And what I mean by that, I'm not throwing stones at you. I'm not, I'm not picking on you. I mean that in your mind, predominantly the, the older generation, and I can, I can say that because I'm not dark-headed anymore, <clears throat> right? Yeah, three of you said hallelujah, yeah. <clears throat> that what, what has happened to us is that we have gone so long in a religious environment that didn't have enough of the moving of the Spirit of God that brought demonstration that we have settled with the fact in our mind that we're going to go out with what we carry. We think, oh, well, I've had this all my life, and I've got diabetes, and I've got this, and I've got that. We've got more pills than we got Cheerios. Right? I'm saying it. And, and in your mind, you said, well, I can't get away without this and without I'm not saying go home and stop taking your medicine. Don't do that. We don't have time for a funeral this week. Don't do that. You, you only get off medication with your doctor's supervision and Jesus' healing because his healing will show up under a microscope. Amen? It will. And you walk that stuff out and you, you target that and he'll do that because he is the healer. See, in the Bible, you can't find anywhere in the Bible where it says, that his stripes were for our healing, oh, except for cancer. <laughs> not that one. That one's too tough. Except for diabetes. No, that doesn't work because there's not enough power in the blood of Jesus to get that one. Who came up with that stuff? We settled. We settled in our mind thinking God is not going to heal me because I'm already over 70 or 60 or 50 or whatever it is you think you have to do. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And we're not just talking about healing, but healing is a big thing to show you because it attaches to everything else you think. If today, how many of you in this room, and I've asked this before, have a physical illness that has not been healed yet? Raise your hand. My hand is up too. Okay, everybody, real high, real high. Those of you that haven't raised your hand up, it's coming. Okay. Now, the point I'm making is, is if right now the Spirit of God just dropped in this place and every one of us were completely healed, 
we would go out of this place with a whole different view of who God actually is. Isn't that true? And so what is it that stops that? What is it? It's not a lack of power from heaven. It's the Ephesians chapter 1. The spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. We don't have the full picture of who Jesus really is. Because if we do, we won't have any problem saying, you can't stay in my body any longer. This belongs to Jesus and you're trespassing. Get out. Right? Now listen, if you're sitting there tonight in your easy chair and you're watching your favorite program and you're eating your whatever meal and you look down and there's a spider on your forearm, are you just going to keep eating your food and watching TV? Are you going to react and respond to the trespassing? All right? You, 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 some of you jump up and do a cat flip before you ever hit the ground because it's a spider on your arm. <laughs> are you with me? And, and, and so that, that insect does not have a legal right to stay on your body. Then why are you giving a free pass to the stuff in your body? <laughs> are you with me? Oh, man, we could just quit right now. Go home and feel spanked all day, right? That, that's not what we're here for. I want to give you some, we may not get page one of the notes, I don't care. The point is, is that we're going to start learning more about who Jesus really is. Are you ready for that? You ready for some wisdom, some revelation and the knowledge of him and what his real heart is for us, the saints? Because when we get it, we carry it. When we carry it, we use it. When we use it, we're not just healed, we become healers. Right? You can't give something you don't have. Sonia, if you won the lottery today, of course, you've got to play before you win it. But if you won a million dollars today, would you loan me a hundred? Huh? Would you? Would you give me a hundred? What's see there? If you have something. You have access to give it away. If you have more than you need, you don't mind giving somebody something, right? So when you and I begin to learn how to access the courts of heaven with a legal right to run out the intruders and trespassers from inside of our body, we're going to get to teach that to people. We're going to lay our hands on the sick like Mark 16 says and says, get out. It says you'll cast out demons Demon spirits of infirmity, demon spirits of cancer, demon spirits of high blood pressure, demon spirits of, you see what I'm saying? That's what it's talking about. I'm ready to do that, amen? It's time for the church, the ecclesia, to rise up and be the governing bodies we were called to be. And not a bunch of whip, beat up Christians just, just dragging across the gates of heaven. No more of that. No, no, no. Listen, if we got to do this and we do... Let's cross the finish line with a handful of hair from both demons on each side of us. Right? Amen. Give the Lord a hand praise. Amen. Now turn with me to the book of Colossians. Back to the book of Colossians. This is such an exciting and enriched study that I want you to make notes, mark, do whatever you have to do so that you can go back, begin to read this, meditate on this, pray about this, ask the Holy Spirit to ingrain this into the way you think, which will become part of your new philosophy, which will manifest itself in your new habits and character and traits as a human. And the Spirit of God will have access for the first time in years to be able to flow through you instead of stopping at the door where you've let the trespassers block the door. Are you with me? Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, here's what it says. By him, and it's talking about Jesus, okay? 
We'll, we'll prove that later. By him were all things created. Okay? Now, now think just, just about that for a minute. By Jesus, all things were created. Okay? Think of this for a minute. That are in heaven, that are in the earth, that are visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now, when you include dominions, principalities, and powers, it means including every demon in hell. Satan himself. He didn't create Satan, he created Lucifer. Lucifer fell and became Satan. Jesus created everything for himself. So, if he controls the level of pressure that you and I face because of our spiritual immaturity, then that means right now, whether you know it or not or believe it or not, he's holding back the gates of hell from taking you out. Are you catching this? I don't care what age you are and how healthy you think you are, you can die in the next five minutes. There's stories popping out all over the place where some 16-year-old kid playing football in practice dropped dead. This happens. That You don't know when it's going to happen or why, but let me tell you something. If the Lord has allowed you to be alive today, he has something for you to do. And if Jesus created all things, he didn't just create the good things. He created things that are going to be opposition to us to help us grow, not to destroy us, but to promote us. So get this picture, because before today, here you are, and Satan is somewhere up here. And the reason I can say that is because we're still carrying stuff that don't belong to us, right? Anybody agree to that? Right? Got to be real if you're going to listen to this. If not, man, you better not come next week because it's going to be worse next week. <laughs> right? Okay, so, so if Jesus created everything and he has this master plan to take us into the place where we understand kingdom and who we are and we're going to train and learn and grow, he put things in place to check us, to test us, to process us, and to vet us. Think of it this way just for a moment. If you have a child, and that child is in first grade, would you buy him a Z28 and give him the keys for Christmas? Why wouldn't you? You you can put blocks on his feet so he can reach the gas. Are you with me? You wouldn't do that because in your mind you know based on history, based on everybody else's kid that came before your kid, they need to go through school. They need to be trained. They need to understand some things. They need to get more responsible. They need to get at least 18 years old legally to even have a license. And then you better pray. I mean, Osei's done really good, man. He got past the 90-90 rule. That, that's, that's, you got a 90% chance of crashing in the first 90 days when you start driving. You've been driving more than three months, haven't you? Look at that, man. Give him a hand. That's good. That just means that his parents decided he displayed enough maturity to handle not just the privilege, but the responsibility of the keys he were given. Woo! <laughs> are you with me now? So why are you whining that Jesus hadn't given you the keys yet because you're spiritually in third grade. Woo! I told you it's going to get bad. <laughs> I don't know, man. We might have just have a prayer meeting from now. You and I complain because we don't have spiritual authority and power when we don't have the wisdom and revelation to handle it. Isn't that something? And listen, I'm including me too. I'm including me as well. I'm going to get there though, I promise you that. 
when the Lord vets someone, I need you to understand this. If he created everything, and he did, he made the heavens, the stars, all those things, everything he created for himself, by himself, all of those things happened, then this plan of taking us through this course of time, these 7,000 years of, of time, whatever, whatever he does, whatever his plan is, he's, he's trying to locate and determine his family in the gene pool. His family are going to carry the DNA of Jesus himself. That's going to bring things into your life and into my life that are going to start displaying characteristics of maturity, characteristics of the family mindset, of kingdom. We're going to start getting it. We're going to start living it. There's a whole world of people that actually go to church that are, that are not even in his family. They're not. They, they don't live for him. Just because you go to church doesn't make you saved. I, I can prove it to you. How many of you have a garage at home? Anybody? How many of you know somebody that has a garage at home? This afternoon, ask them if you can come over and stand in their garage and see if you become a car. Just because you go to the garage doesn't make you a car. Just because you show up at church doesn't make you right. doesn't make you saved. It doesn't make you trustworthy for the power and anointing of God. <laughs> Man. Remember James and John? I mean, this is the end of his ministry, not the beginning. This is the end. And they're going and they come and these Samaritans don't even pay them attention. And they're like, who do you think you are? This is Jesus in our clique. We got Jesus in our group. And you're not going to pay any attention to this. You're going to go about doing your own stuff. They were actually doing it right. Jesus said, leave them alone. They're doing fine. And James and John are like, should we call fire down from heaven? Look at your neighbor and say, that's why you don't have power today. Many of you can't get over your offenses. You can't get over your unforgiveness. You're so full of pride, you can't handle the keys to the car. If you had the power of heaven, you'd kill most people you know. Are you with me? Oh, man, we better get on. I, I, I'm like Larry. That was free. That wasn't even in my notes, man. <laughs> Verse 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Are you catching this? Verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church. Now, just like I was telling you all ago, if you, if you go sit down in the evening, you look down and there's something on your arm that doesn't belong, you're going to get rid of it. If he's the head of the body, that's a decision he makes. If there's something poison on his body, he'll cut it out. <laughs> Are you catching this? So how much do you think you know about God? Are you with me? His word is the one that's going to filter the people that are going to end up in his family. Just because you showed up at church and threw your hands up and cried a little bit, got wet back there in the baptism, doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Doesn't mean that. It's a start. It's a beginning place. When I read uh, Dennis Goworthy Davis's book a few weeks ago, called Unlimited Anointing, I was so mind blown and angry and excited and angry because you and I were taught all of our lives that when you finally get to the place where you receive the Holy Ghost and you speak in tongues, you've made it to the top of the spiritual chain. How many think that? And see, there's a lot of people in this room hadn't spoken in tongues yet. You haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. You haven't spoken in tongues. 
I'm not throwing darts at you. I'm saying there's more on the table of God you haven't partaken of. He spreads a table in the presence of our enemies, and there's a power that goes with the Holy Ghost that's unlike anything else in your life. The power of the Holy Spirit will unleash on your enemy like nobody you know. The power of the Holy Spirit will train you, lead you, and guide you into all truth. will take Scripture and break it into revelation. The Holy Spirit will empower you with power to do the things God called you to do. Without that, you're just learning. I'm not saying you're lost, but in that book of unlimited anointing, he starts there. He doesn't end up there. He starts there because the gifts of the Spirit, I'm not an English major, but of the Spirit is a prepositional phrase that actually means it consists of the Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit, you don't have any gifts of the Spirit. Are you with me? So when you receive the Spirit, it opens you up to the supernatural gifts of the Spirit. So you're not going to be this and you're not going to be that and you're not going to do this and do that until you get the Spirit of God. Then he goes through 10 levels of anointing that you can actually experience. And it's amazing. It's awesome. It's exciting. It's new. It's fresh bread. It's something to look at and begin to achieve and walk for and, and, and be in place for. Get yourself in position to be more for God. Doesn't he deserve more than you're giving him? Amen. Listen, I, that's only three people clapped. I ain't going for that. You, you, he deserves more than any of us give him. Amen. And I'm not just talking about time to pray or study. That's for you. I'm talking about you and I actually get it so that we can do something for the kingdom we've never done. Part of our mandate and job description comes from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, when he says, go and have dominion. Take dominion. It means to dominate your enemy. And you're being dominated by your enemy. Oh, man. Prayer meeting time, isn't it? Listen. You get 30 minutes of this. I get four days of it. So deal with it, right? Chin up. <laughs> okay, here we go. Get back to, get back to page one, man. We, got, got, we ain't going to make it. We ain't going to make it past page one. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9 says, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. It's another scripture to confirm to you that everything you see in existence was created by Jesus himself. And the the religious world wants to demote him down to some being that that popped out in Bethlehem. Oh, no. No, 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 no. You need to understand that he's the physical manifestation of God himself. There before the creation of the world, that's why it said, let us make man in our image. Who do you think was talking? A spirit doesn't have an image, does it? Jesus did. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. Oh, this is getting deep, right? (laughs) Uh, Here we go. So Jesus created it all. John chapter 1, verse 1. Turn to John. You need to see this. You need to mark this. You need to get this. John chapter 1. In the beginning, everybody say beginning. That means before Adam messed up. In the beginning was the word The Word was God, or the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In other words, it was already inside of him, everything he was going to arrange and plan out. And and listen, here's how it works. It's like you and I read the Bible. 
we, le- we read the Old Testament, we read the New Testament, and you think, oh, man, how could he have done that? Who, who, who made that decision? Why was he so dumb? Why did he do this? You think you would have done better, right? No, you wouldn't. Because here's the, here's the story. In the heart of the Creator, he wrote the story. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. It was in him. And so as the word was there and time for you and I began, people started becoming born and stepping into their word. Adam stepped into his role as Adam. Don't look back and get angry at Adam. So you and I come on the scene at the end of the 6,000 years, right here before things start to shift and we go into the 1,000-year millennium to rule and reign with Christ and think we're just going to all get in, we're going to say what we're supposed to say, get oil on our head, get baptized, speak in tongues a little bit, and then wait for Jesus to show up with our lunch bag. (laughs) Oh, no. You don't get out like that. Because in your book that he wrote about you in Psalms 139, he wrote things about you and your life that he intends to use in you to bring his kingdom to earth to take back what the enemy did to begin with. You have a mandate and a responsibility all by yourself that has nothing to do with this church. You have a mandate. Every one of us has a story, and you access that story in the secret place. In Matthew, the Lord says, those that he sees in the secret place, he'll reward in public. So you get in there, and you find out what is your role, what is your next step. He's not going to share the whole book with you, because he knows you better than that. Right? Right? You tell your 15-year-old son you're going to buy him a Z28, he'll get beat up every day at school from then on. Because he's so full of pride, he's going to go around and tell everybody he's going to get a Z28, and you're riding a bicycle to school. You'll beat him up. You need to understand that you have to handle the blessing of God. You have to understand how to grow and handle it. Now I'm going to give you a free one that's not my notes either, and then we've got to change. All of these years, I've tried to figure out why Jesus waited till he was 30 to start his ministry. Has anybody ever thought of that? Raise your hand. Be honest if you thought about that. Keep it up. I've always wondered, why did you wait, man? You're so bad to the bone, you should have started when you was 12. Right? Well, let me tell you a little bit about the Jewish culture that I'm learning. In the Jewish culture, there's five different types of explanation for the stages of life you grow in, beginning with baby. And then you grow, and it's tech, technos, and, and, and di- there's different ones that explain. We us, it's a gr- as you grow, it changes. You go from a young person to a, a, a teen to a young, young adult, and then full adulthood, where there's a place that you get to, that you're trying to get to the whole time, and it's a place of maturity, not just chronologically, but a mental maturity that matches your chronological age and causes you to be trusted by the Father. Are you with me? In the Jewish culture, they have a celebration at the age 30, and they, they bring in all the people and they say, okay, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Does that sound familiar? And he now has the keys to my stuff. He now has the checkbook with my name on it. He now has the keys to my house and to this business. If he speaks, I speak. If he says something, I'm saying it. If he says something to you, I'm backing it up. Because now he's earned the respect and I am pleased in him, with him, and about him. 
So because of the culture, because it was recognized for what it was, had Jesus launched his ministry at 25, everybody looked and go, boy, he's a nut, isn't he? He was 30, and he walks out into the water, and then the sky opens up, and the, and the, and the father speaks and said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And the ministry began. <laughs> Isn't that mind-blowing? So there are protocols to the culture that you and I live in. And without the revelation of the Holy Ghost giving us step-by-step instruction, whoo, man, I feel it, of understanding not just who you are, but who he is. You're never going to represent the Father if you don't know him. This is not about coming to church. It's about being the church. Stop thinking religiously and start thinking family. Are you with me? Man, I got to stop, Brad. I ain't going to. We'll pick up next week with that. Wow. (laughs) All I can tell you is the more you learn about how awesome Jesus Christ is, the more you're going to understand what worship really looks like. Do you mean, you mean to tell you when you're going to worship the most? It's when you receive revelation. When you receive revelation, it's going to blow your mind. And you're going to find yourself face down on the floor. Going, Lord, what can I do? What can I do to please you? What can I do to honor you? What can I do to bring glory to your name? And he's going to go... That's my son. That's my daughter in whom I am well pleased. Now I'm going to let some of the family power go to them so they can walk over to that person in the wheelchair and say, you can get up now. Are you following this? Don't miss next week. Don't miss next week. Can we just give the Lord some praise? We do that. Let's stand up. Let's stand up and give him a standing ovation. He deserves it.